everyone and welcome to Stay Tuned. Thank you for watching. My name is Ray Hotoda and I'm the music director and conductor of the Fresno Philharmonic. And Stay Tuned is an opportunity for us to interview the composers who are featured in our Digital Masterworks series this season. So today we are so thrilled to introduce to you Kevin Day. Hi, Kevin. Hey, hey, hey. It's a pleasure to be here and it's a pleasure to meet you. Yes, and we are so thrilled to do your world premiere of your piece, Locomotion. And uh, so tell us a little bit about this piece. Yeah, so Locomotion was a piece that I had written back in 2017, near, near when I was sort of towards the latter half of my degree at TCU. And so I was working on this piece with my teacher, just kind of uh, just, just for fun. It, it, it wasn't for any commission or anything like that, but I just wanted to just sort of try, try to work with an instrumentation that I haven't really worked with before and um, just sort of toying around with the different sounds and the different possibilities with these combinations. And so um, locomotion, so the, the reason why it's called that, it's, it's a piece about this idea of intensity and momentum. It's, it's like a locomotive train that is moving. And so there are a lot of intricate parts to make this train move. There's a lot of, of um, trade-offs between uh, woodwinds and the strings and the and the piano and the marimba and so it's it's really a ride and 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 that's really it's it's a piece that is about this kind of energy so I'm really really excited to hear this played. Great. Well, we're excited to premiere it next week. Now I want to ask you why you parenthesize the loco in locomotion. There must be a reason why you did that. Yeah, it's it's more so loco meaning like like this this craziness. Cause when you listen to this, there's just a lot of things that are moving very fast and it's a lot of um, craziness. So part of this motion is having this idea of just things that seem to be out of control, but are actually very controlled within the scheme of the piece. Right. And the instrumentation is very fascinating to me. You know, the, the clarinet with the marimba, and then we have the piano with the strings, the violin, viola, and cello. And so it's interesting how you um, would, interplay the, the different um, gestures, you know, in the piece with these mm -hmm. different instruments. And I have to tell you, you know, the clarinetist was very perplexed sometimes <laughs> in his runs. <laughs> I think you and Peter were talking a few times about, you know, different fingerings and things like that. And, um, yes. So it was, it is a challenging work, but so satisfying and it's so, um, it's got so much frenetic energy, like you were saying. Uh, yeah, and, and that's super enjoyable to play. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. And yeah, Peter and I had a couple of conversations about uh, the transposition of the part because <laughs> it's originally in in um, B flat clarinet, but he told me it worked a lot better as an A clarinet part. So that's what I also love about doing world uh, world premieres and collaborations in general. It's just like you get to work with people who like know their craft, know their instrument, and can give you suggestions. Because I'm a brass player, I'm a piano player. I don't know much about clarinet, <laughs> so it's really nice to have someone who can say, "Hey, this would look a lot. This would work way better if you just did this." And so I'm very much open to those ideas. Well, besides the composer, you're also a conductor, and like you mentioned, a pianist. But you're a jazz pianist, and a fantastic one, I have to say. Um, but you're Thank also you. a producer and you play different uh, wind instruments too. And so can you tell us a little bit about your background in music and how you got to learn all these instruments and what inspired you to do that? Sure thing. So my initial contact to music was through my parents. My dad um, used to be a hip hop producer in the late 1980s and it's early 1990s in Southern California. And my mom was a gospel singer from West Virginia. And so a lot of the music I grew up in were those two worlds. I was immersed in the worlds of like Blackstreet, Jodeci, Tupac Shakur, Notorious B.I.G. on the one hand. And on the other hand, I was listening to things, you know, Kirk Franklin, Fred Hammond, um, Ty Tribbett, things like that. And so I grew up in very much with those worlds, um, 
being part of my of my sound and just a part of what I was always around. And so I decided I wanted to join the band uh, lo loosely through seeing the movie Drumline, if you know what that movie is from a long time ago. And I wanted to be a saxophonist initially because I was just like, oh, that looks so cool. And I would love to be able to, to, to do that. And so I get to the audition as a sixth grader and they're like, oh, we have too many saxophones, which seems to be a, a thing, like having too many saxophones. So. They wanted to put me on a brass instrument and they ended up giving me this horn called a euphonium. And at the time I had no idea what this horn was. I was just like, what is this? But it ended up being the instrument that I ultimately fell in love with. And so b before I joined band though, I was a young musician playing you know, piano initially and playing percussion uh, with my parents at certain gospel gigs. And then later I did a lot of jazz gigs. And so my education was like basically Monday through Friday, I was in grade school. I was playing in band as a euphoniumist and then later tuba. And then on the weekends or sometimes throughout the week, I would be playing jazz piano and gospel piano and things like that. And then now I can just, it's, it's, it's a thing where, um, I can just kind of pick up things really easily. I don't have any classical training, but I have this here that can kind of pick up different different kinds of music. So I'm trying to expand that now actually to play new music, to play uh, classical, trying to learn some things and um, still keeping up my chops as a jazz piano player. Well, what's incredible at a young age, you are 25 years old and you have written 150 works, is that correct? Yes, yeah, so we're getting closer to 200, but yes, wow. we're, we're getting wow. closer. That's amazing, and your pieces have been performed by uh, major orchestras across the country, but around the world, in Russia, in Japan as well. Um, so kudos to you, that's fantastic. You, you have such an incredible energy to write so much music already. <laughs> Thank you. It's it's what I'm passionate about. And I, when I was trying to decide where my life was going to go um, initially, I thought I was going to go down one path and just be a performer. And I ultimately, the times I should have been practicing, I was composing till like 3 a.m. till 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 till, till four o'clock in the morning, and then getting up for my theory class or my my ear training class. And so I just I, I that was was and is my escape and and oftentimes my refuge. And so um, I just love composing. I love trying to come up with new ideas. And I also just love collaborating um, with, with um, incredible musicians. Well, I wanna ask you, has your artistry or your approach to writing changed over the last 18 months? The last 18 months, yes, it has. Um, it crazy enough, like 2019 was my was my busiest year traveling. Like I felt like I was on a plane every other week in 2019. I was going to to different places, and then when 2020 came, and I had one last premiere that happened at the North American Saxophone Alliance Conference in Tempe, Arizona. I got back to Atlanta, and that's when everything started to shut down, and that's when the lockdowns took place. So. It drastically threw off my commission schedule. It threw off, you know, everything because everyone didn't know like what was going to happen. So it was definitely a point where I had to kind of step back and I had to reevaluate how I'm doing things, why I'm doing things, and I, I had to a lot of I had to do a lot of reflection and just introspection during that time. So there was a lot of pieces during that time frame that sort of came out of this uh, process. So I'm still sort of in that vein now, although I'm writing things that I, where I'm trying to blend things from my background together more and just um, trying to see what else I can kind of come up with. So I'm just, I'm really excited for what's coming for the pieces that are uh, going to be happening. Well, um, tell us a little soon. bit about that. What, what are some future um, thing, uh, commissions or projects that you have um, in the pipeline? Yeah, so right now, uh, once again, mostly due to the pen, uh, the, to the pandemic, most of my work has kind of shifted from mostly doing wind band pieces and orchestra pieces to doing more chamber stuff. So I have a lot of chamber pieces that are coming for various instrumentations and for, and for various groups. And uh, but the the piece I'm most excited about is probably the well, it, it is the largest work that I've ever composed to date, and it's a concerto for wind ensemble. And this piece is a 25 to 30 minute long um, composition. It's it's. 
five movements long. And so this piece was in the works before the pandemic began. And so it's a piece where I intentionally like merge the music of my childhood with uh, the wind band medium. And um, I'm just really excited uh, for this piece. There's, there's, there's 23 schools that are on this consortium that are gonna be playing this. Um, and the premiere is supposed to be taking place this uh, September. So I'm really thrilled. What's it called? I'm curious. What's the piece called? The piece is called Concerto for Wind Ensemble. So that's the name of the work. And, um, you know, the last, uh, there there are concertos for wind ensemble. There's concertos for wind orchestra, um, really famous pieces. And so this, this is sort of me kind of just being as authentic as I know how. And that's the only thing I can do. And uh, just sort of contributing to to um, to these other concerti written for the medium. Yes. Well, there's one piece that I'm really fascinated uh, and I'd love to program sometime is the Manhattan Nights. Oh, yeah. And I think uh, it, it reminds me so much of Gershwin, jazz, but also you have this incredible talent, again, like you were saying, to write genuinely of who you are. And I hear that in this piece. So hmm. I, I just uh, I just think you're extremely talented and I um, just want to encourage you to, you know, keep writing uh, for Thank you. your orchestras and, and uh, larger ensembles. Yeah, Manhattan Nights was one of my first orchestral pieces, actually. And so uh, I had submitted that to um, this contest with the Philadelphia Youth Orchestra um, with Luis Scaglione as the conductor. And so they did that piece in 2018. I ended up winning this competition with them. And yeah, it, it was the first piece where I was trying to mix mix genres and mix jazz and mix all these different sounds in my head <laughs> and try to figure it out. So yeah, I'm I'm glad that you like the piece. It's it's yeah. it's it's um it's a piece that I really enjoyed writing. And, and what's interesting now that you have written 150, almost 200 pieces, you are going to pursue a doctorate in composition. Is that right? <laughs> yes. So where my where where life has gone, I have a bachelor's in music performance from TCU, uh, where I was on tuba and euphonium and jazz piano. And then now I'm getting ready to complete a master's in composition at the University of Georgia. And for my last degree, I'm happy to say I will be going to the University of Miami Frost School of Music for my DMA in composition. And so I'm really thrilled to get to go down to Florida. I've never been to a beach. I've, I've never, <laughs> you know, I'm a Texas boy. I don't know anything about beaches, but I'm really excited for this, this next chapter. Wow, we wish you all the best of luck. Best of Thank luck you. with that. Um, so I want to ask you what you would like to share with young composers today. First of all, I have to say everyone should look at your website because it is a dream for conductors to look through and listen to everything and see the instrumentation. I say young composers, follow Kevin's <laughs> uh, uh, website guidelines because that's very instrumental, really key to you know really getting your music played. So thank you. Bravo to you. So what would you say to young composers today? Definitely the website thing is important. And the, the newest website, that, that took a while for me to do because I had a website that I made when I was an undergrad and I ended up keeping it um, for a long time. I didn't make many changes to it. And then late last year, I was talking to my manager and I was just like, okay, I need to, I need to get a better look. I need to... to to freshen things up a bit. And so we decided to, to go with this new website and um, I'm really thrilled that you enjoy it. It's um, it's a website that I made in collaboration with my manager. And so um, that's it, that's the whole thing with websites is I wanted to make it easy for people to, to navigate, to, to listen to, to see where the instrumentation is, uh, where to buy it, where to purchase it, perusal scores, all that stuff. So I, I'm hoping to continue the, to, to add to that. Um, so yeah, that's really important. The other thing I think is just when I was first beginning out um, composing, I was writing a lot of my music for my friends. So, so I was writing for people who I trusted, who I could, you know, who would be honest with me. Um, before I started getting comfortable putting things like on social media and in the internet, because <laughs> I was actually quite uh, scared at first. Because I was just like, oh, well, what if people don't like it and you know all that stuff and eventually like now I just get to the point where I'm just like you know what I'm gonna put it out there 
Um, if people are receptive to it, great. If not, okay, that's fine. Because I think I, I think I've gotten to the point now where I understand that music and musical tastes are subjective in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, so just being comfortable or getting to the point where you are comfortable, once you can write for your friends, then writing for people who you don't know and, and being comfortable sort of sharing th that music with uh, the outside world. Uh, so those are two really important things that have helped me. Great. Well, thank you, Kevin, for being a part of our Stay Tuned uh, series. Of course. Everyone, please, please watch our world premiere next week, April 17th at 5.30 p.m on our Facebook, YouTube, and Fresno Philharmonic website pages. Um, so thank you all for watching and see you next time. Thank you.